Everybody like the intro music. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Real Estate Roundtable. I am Jason Bates, the host, and I host a podcast here in Phoenix, Arizona called Valley of the Sun Real Estate Show. And you can check that out by visiting my website at www.valleyofthesunrealestateshow.com and connect with me on any social media and especially here on Blab. If you're in Blab, connect with me on Blab. And don't forget to tell a little friend here. And again, the loyal Jorge Cuervas. How you doing, man? Good, man. How are you? It's good to see you again. I'm doing uh, too blessed to be stressed. That is my saying for 2016. That's how I'm doing. It's all good. <laughs> too blessed to be stressed. I love that saying, man. Um, and I am too blessed to be stressed. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and it is nice. Well, it was cold here uh, this week, if you can call it cold. Um, it was down near freezing at night. Yeah. Now we're going to be 80 degrees on Sunday. So that, there you go. That's, that's nothing compared to here. Here is just cold. Today the sun came out, so it was nice here for that reason, uh, but it's still it's cold. Yeah. yeah, I was saying uh, to to the folks before we got started there that um, I saw some Snapchat uh, mm -hmm. pictures um, of Justin there in Chicago. And he showed some pictures of his, he was all bundled up and he had just his eyeballs poking out of his ski mask and his dog was running around. There was snow on the ground and yeah. it looked cold. Look yeah, cool. a lot of snow melted now up here, but it was it was cold. I, I was in I was shooting a, a rehab property today that was under construction, and it was um we were in there for like two hours. It was freezing. It was freezing today. It was cold. All right, cool. <laughs> well, let's, it's, it is cold, man. It's well February. February is the coldest month. Let's get right to this, man. January actually was a little bit of a slow month for news. However, there are some news stories, and I think there's some. Uh, news stories that are uh, worth talking about and having a discussion about. Um, so there, obviously, we're in the middle of a campaign right now, right? There's right. people are dropping out, whatever. Um, but candidates are starting to weigh in. We've had this thing hanging over our heads here for a while about whether or not mortgage interest would be tax deductible in the future, if that would be coming off the table anytime soon. Yeah. And some of the yeah. candidates are starting to weigh in on that. Uh, ben Carson weighed on it and said, no, it's you know, under his administration, of course not. Um, but there are, and I, I'm not big political, you know, I don't follow politics like, you know, CNN or something like that. But I think if if they were to take off the deduction for mortgage uh, on your taxes, I think it would hurt. Hurt the overall motivation. I, not that people purchase a home just for the tax. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was that, was that <laughs> website. Um, not that people purchase that stuff for or purchase a home for the tax deduction solely, but you know, a lot of accountants tell people to go purchase a home for the tax deduction. So, the, what do you think about the, that? The problem is the that problem. Um, taxes are too high in the first place, high, first and place. Um, <laughs> instead of instead of uh, offering an incentive for buying a home, so you're already recognizing the problem that the taxes are high. And that you have to give the tax break so that people can get that mortgage deduction uh, off the interest so that they can, you know, have money to afford to be able to pay for whether it's the mortgage itself or whatever else. Um, it, it, it's it, to me, it's just it doesn't make any sense at all. You should should have a well, flat, I, I'm a flat tax guy. And and then and, and the thing is, it's because of this kind of stuff. The, the politicians play around with issues like this. Now, right now, that's the way it is. So we need it now and it, you have to keep it in place because it's it's like part of everyday business. If you were to take it away, if you were to take away the, the deduction, you'd have to lower taxes so that you, you so that homeowners wouldn't be hit with a tax increase, you know, because right now they're already used to getting that deduction. A certain amount at least uh, is being deducted. So th that's why a politician should never have that type of power over homeowners when it comes to taxes and how much they pay and everything else. So it, to me, the, the problem is already skewed because the taxes are too high. But I think every time we have an election cycle, all the politicians and the media too try to bring up stuff. And housing is one of those touch button issues for everybody because we all live in houses. We all, we, we all, it affects everybody. So I hate when they bring that kind of shit up 
and I hate when it when it comes up uh, because um, because it, it, when they bring it up, no one's going to change it. No one's going to do anything about it. But they're trying to rustle the feathers and and get some people agitated and stuff like that when it's it does start to get talked about. Well, th- now that's part of the deal, right? They're saying, hey, look, if we if we just simplify the tax code, we get rid of these loopholes and these deductions, and we just go to a flat tax. Well, part of the deduction is having mortgage interest as a tax deduction. Um, you know, maybe I don't know. Maybe that maybe a flat tax would be good, and it wouldn't. You know, nobody would even notice it. Um, but right now, as you say, if, as, if there's not a flat tax or some kind of simplified code, I'm going to agree. It's man, you take away that tax deductibility for the mortgage. Man, that's that's a that's a that's yeah, a pretty it, good size it, it, deduction for me, anyways. Each each year. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you have politicians and the media sort of playing around with those hot topic issues that they know is going to, you know, make people get involved into it or or get people want to say, oh, my God, I better I better I'm going to have to vote this year because they might be taking away my mortgage deduction insurance. No one's going to take it away. They're not going to put that on the table, but they do things like this on purpose to get people riled up, I think. Yeah, Trump Trump actually said here. um uh, in his little way, I guess he, he kind of repeats himself a little bit, but they kind of simplified yeah. it here a little bit. He said, uh, you'll see what's going to happen to real estate. You want to see a crash? Try that one. So yeah. he's basically saying, hey, look, if you want to, you know, take the tax deductibility away, you could potentially see a crash in real estate. So I, you know, I don't know. I, this, this is going to go on and on and on. It's, it's been going on. It seems like a conversation that just won't go away. And I don't know. Um, I don't know what the right answer is on that, but, um, it's there, it's a complicated issue. <laughs> there there's a lot of national issues in regards to housing policy, and this would be one of those uh, under it. Um, yeah. I think this is this is one of those issues where mortgage brokers, um, real estate agents, and everybody else in between that's uh, tied to the real estate industry. Um, this is the part of like whether you get involved with the RPACs or whatever they're called for the real estate uh, agents. Um, you know, the political action committees for on behalf that service the real estate industry. Um, some of them are good. Some are bad. They tend to just talk about the same issues all the time. So they're obviously they're always concerned about this issue. Um, but I um, like I said, it's not going anywhere. It's just made. It's just put out there to rile people up, to get people yeah, interested I think that, in the election. And I think that's it's about a vote. You know, hey, yeah. how do I separate myself from the competitors in the in the race? Because Carson's the one offering the flat tax. You know, Trump is saying, "Hey, that'll that'll kill the real estate market." Rubio is kind of saying the same thing. Um, uh, deduction. Uh, Jeb Bush is saying the same thing that the 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 um, taking away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you, you see that yesterday? Did he ask for applause? I think. Did you I, see that? I, I I didn't see it. I, I you know what? I, I'm a right winger, but I can't stand the Republicans. And and I I watch this stuff, and it's just like a joke. Even just the fact that we're just the fact that you know, even like look at us, where we're talking about this, we know they're not going to do anything with it, um, because it, if it but, were uh, ever, if it were ever to get even that far, you would have yeah. every homeowner in America, regardless of what political affiliation they were in, would be raising their voice. You know, yeah. Um, so it, it's just not going to get that far. No politician well, wants. No right? politician wants to be that guy that takes that away. And businesses. I mean, when businesses own real estate, they get to deduct some of that. So, um, yeah. in the form of depreciation or whatever. So, um, you know, taking these these loopholes, so to speak, away would yeah. would affect yeah. a lot of people for sure. I mean, uh, ultimately, so, if you're if you're a real estate agent or if you're a broker, and it's not to be getting the politics or anything like that, but you want to have good, sound fiscal policy, you know, the types of actions taking place on a on a federal and on a state and on a local level. And when that doesn't happen and you let government get out of control and spend lots of money um, and they become financially instable and like the state of Illinois or the state of California, um, you only bad things happen. That's how schools start. That's how school funding gets cut. That's how funding for roads get cut. That's how all this, all the public services you need to run a fucking city start to get cut. And then the politicians go back and ask for more money. You have to have, um, you, you have to have responsible government. There's a, there's a role for government and everything. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, like if any, if there was any industry that had an interest in, keeping um, the government streamlined and only focused on the things that's supposed to be focused on, it really should be real estate because um, 
uh, everything they do when they do mess things up affects housing directly. Okay, so with that being said, let's jump into the next section here because you just hit on something that um, I think is uh, vitally important to um, the future of of housing and where it's going to go because I do feel that politicians do have somewhat of a responsibility um, to help the housing situation, not overextend, not, you know, and and again, I'm not a political advocate here on either side, but to keep people in their homes, um, you know, keep the economy moving at such a rate that people can afford to earn a living, to afford a home, that sort of thing. Um, there is some, some responsibility and obviously HUD is having some serious difficulties right now. And I I want to play this here right now, um, because Julian Castro was at a Google talk and I'll kind of set the, set the tone here. Google talk is kind of like Ted talks or whatever. And he spoke about, and he was asked specifically, what are the summarize the problems at HUD for us? And so let me play that clip here and see, hopefully you guys can hear it. Um, because I, I, it was interesting to me that he actually recognizes some of the problems, whether it's going to fix it or not. I don't know, but at least he's recognizes. So let's play it. Right. Cause they strike me as sort of overwhelming. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's fair to say that they are very, very significant. Uh, they're massive. I saw this both as a mayor and now even more so as HUD secretary. Um, to begin with, we have a rental affordability crisis out there. Uh, a few months ago, the National Low-Income Housing Coalition put out a, a piercing study that said basically that there isn't a single community in the United States of any size where if you're working full-time minimum wage, you can afford the rent on a two-bedroom apartment. And very, very few places where you can afford the rent on even a one-bedroom apartment. That's crazy to me. No, that's the reality. I mean, the, I know, but, but, you know, like any, and here's the thing he should have, I mean, he knows this all, anyone that follows it on a, on a macro level knows that the housing affordability index rate, uh, has been going out of whack, whether you're rent, whether you're renting or buying. And, um, and that's because we have an economy where wages are not growing. Wages have actually dropped in the last eight years and actually, and they started dropping in the last year there at Bush. But uh, we have wa- we have no wage growth, and we have an economy that's spluttering around at about like two and a half to three percent of GDP growth. So when you have those types of economic factors, um, people if people people need to get raises, people need to get promoted, people need to have opportunities in order for them to be able to pay more for housing. And right now we have an inventory levels that are tight on most places around the country. So that's going to push prices up. We have more people that want to rent right now and there's not enough rental properties. So supply and demand kicks in and that's why rents are high everywhere. And then with housing, you know, it's not, it, it doesn't make sense enough for the builders to go all in and start building like crazy again. Builders are very cautious. So the housing supply is staying very tight and pricing is going up as high as it can because of housing affordability. Um, and, and so like right now you've got this thing where, uh, the, if the economy doesn't grow, if we don't have like, we don't, it's not that we need like in our boom, like super boom thing, but we do need actual real growth in the economy. And we need to have some type of a um, uh, confidence in the future of the market. And I, I don't think we have that. I don't think we've had that for the last eight years. And I think right now things are on hold until we, until we find out who the next president's going to be. So let me, let me continue on because he does say some other things here. So, uh, and I just kind of fast forward it to the other, other section here. So let, let me play this. This is about a, I don't know, this is about a 30 second clip here. So let me play this. Okay. Yeah. You have that affordability crisis. The home ownership rate in the United States right now is at a four decade low. Obviously we went through the housing crisis and um, if the story 10 years ago in 2005 was that it was too easy to get a home loan. The story today is that oftentimes for middle-class families, for folks who have an average credit score, but who would be responsible, um, they can't get a home loan. It's too tough. And uh, lending to minority communities is at a 13 or 14 year low. Uh, So you combine those two things of less home ownership, more people competing in the rental market, uh, and it adds up to a massive challenge in terms of affordability and housing opportunities. 
So, uh, you know, I thought that was interesting that he even recognizes um, kind of the, all the factors that play in it, kind of what you were saying. Rents here in Arizona have gone through the roof. I mean, right. it's crazy right. how much you got to pay for rent here right now. Yeah, right. but it, but that's because you have a lot more. You have a lot of people that want to rent, and we just went through a whole period where there were, you know, <clears throat> there were no new rental properties. There hasn't been this huge influx to go start putting more rental properties until recently. So it takes time to put more rent. If, if the demand for more rental properties goes up, you can't just throw new rental properties onto the into the inventory streams. It takes time for builders, developers, and and um, uh, to either convert buildings or build new buildings for uh, accommodating that that demand and rental. So in the meantime, you have what's happening right now. The market's trying to figure itself out. And whenever you have like a, a low, if we had a booming economy, then we would have the same problem with housing where prices would start to go up too high for people to be able to afford. And it would take time for new construction to be able to fill in that gap and, and, and be able to offer something for the marketplace. So he's like partly right, but he's blaming the wrong thing. So if you want to blame anything, it's, it has, it's directly tied to where we, where the economy is at today and that, yeah, no. that, that there's no consumer confidence for the future and where this whole, you know, this whole thing's headed towards. But the, the economy hasn't, um, although it's rebounded, you know, obviously it's not as bad as it was, right? We still have the underemployed, but there, there seems to be somewhat of a, an advantage, uh, somebody, you know, I don't want to say lenders, but uh, what do we, what do I want to say here? Landlords, um, people who have these homes taking advantage of the situation a little bit too. How do we, uh, the problem, like in San Francisco, San Francisco right now has people sleeping underneath bridges. Huh. I mean, that to me is just insane. Um, and, and that's not a good image for uh, a city especially they're holding the Super Bowl this weekend, right? And you got people sleeping under a bridge. Not saying some people are drug addicted. I mean, there's all kinds of issues that go along with homelessness. I get it. Um, but even for the people who, um, you know, foreclosures are starting to hit even middle-class families where you're making really good money, yet you can't afford even to pay rent. And if you can't afford to pay rent, you certainly can't afford to save money to purchase a home. And so we're caught in this little window here or this kind of rock in a hard place pay rent, keep doing that, you know, hope the the landlord doesn't raise rent on me and at some point it breaks and then I can start saving money so I can put down on a house or I go out and look for down payment assistance programs so I can get into a home. Yeah. Uh, because here in Phoenix, it's actually cheaper to buy in most cases than it is to rent. I know it's not true in all parts of the country, but here in Phoenix, um, you know, yeah, it is. There's a lot of markets like that, you know, but the but the problem is also is that Buying a house also isn't the best alternative for everybody, even if it's cheaper than uh, renting, uh, mainly because it yeah. depends on what there's. Uh, there's so many factors with everybody's situation. Some people aren't exactly secure that their job's still going to be there in two or three years, you know, and, yeah. nobody, and, and after just coming out of the foreclosure crisis, you've got a whole generation of millennials that are going into the real, starting to get into the real estate market. And each one of them has either a family member or their family themselves or someone close to their family. They, they all know somebody that went through foreclosure and got thrown out of their fucking house. And, and yeah. that, you know, you grow up with that, knowing a family that went through that. And uh, we all, we, we, I'm sure you know people, I know people that went through it. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's a, the, that kind of experience is the kind of thing that people, you know, don't want to experience. And when you know, it's very personal and, and nobody wants to go through something like that. So, you know, for a lot of millennials, uh, you know, nobody, the millennials jump around more than any other, um, you know, more than our generation did from job to job because you, you know, you're, you're not loyal to your job, you know? So I think that uh, we are going to see, I, I think renting is okay now. I, I think that the stigma behind it, like if you were uh, 35 and still renting it maybe 10 years ago, I'd been like, why? And today I think you could be 35 or 40 or 65 years old and it's okay to rent. It just depends on what your, what your plan is and where you're headed towards and where, what part of your life are you in, in terms, you know, finance and in career and everything else. And everybody's in very different, different places at very different ages. Well, it was just interesting what he said too, about, um, the, the, um, uh, just the whole affordability and the, all these things kind of, it's almost like a perfect storm kind of thing going yeah. on. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's beyond his control. I mean, it's, it's much bigger than any one person, any one 
yeah. division well, of the government. Yeah. Well, it's bigger but than he, it's bigger than HUD, and, and but I think he's also thinking that HUD can do something about it, which yeah, which I think that that isn't something that they don't have the power to do that. So I think where he was kind of going, but wasn't going to say it. And I, I'm glad you played that clip. I think he was trying to go like, I think we need, he mentioned the whole thing about minorities and banks and mortgage lenders and stuff like that. And we all know that they want lenders to lend in minority neighborhoods. And right. You know, the reason why lenders don't lend in minority neighborhoods as much as they do in non minority neighborhoods because the risk is higher. And, you know, it depends on the bank and whatever they're, whatever, however they're going to risk and what they want, capital they want to risk and all that kind of stuff. Let me, let me stop you. It's not the area is riskier. It's the quality of the borrower well, yeah, may be yeah. riskier. Well, well yeah, but yeah. They, the quality of borrow tends to, but those borrowers, I mean, I, I come from a Mexican neighborhood and, and there's a lot of borrowers in our, in our Mexican neighborhood, in our communities where they're not as credit worthy. They have steps to take if they want to get credit right. worthy. And they're jumping around yeah, for a job, job that, you know, that, that, that doesn't mean that they're bad people or anything. It just means that that's just the reality of it. it so the, the way, the way you fix it though, is by improving the economy, because if yeah. people can be more gainfully employed, if people can see more opportunities, then they have the ability to be able to get into the housing market. Everybody wants to buy a house, but it, it it's more of a factor of do they have the ability to? And the government can't give them the ability. They have to be able to generate that income on their own. That's the way you want them to to, to enter the market. Yeah. That's what makes for a yeah. strong housing market. So let me play this last clip here too from him because it was interesting. Um, he gives some insight into, into HUD here in this last little clip here. That I'll play this clip here. Let me look at my notes here. It's, it's not very long. It's about twenty seconds long, okay. um, but he gives some some insight as to um, what HUD's kind of experienced over the past few years. Okay. HUD, uh, HUD as a department has been more and more stressed or burdened over time. Uh, to give you an example of that, the day that Reagan walked into the Oval Office in January of nineteen eighty one, HUD had over sixteen thousand employees. Uh, today, it has about eight thousand employees. So it's that's crazy. Cut in half, yet the demand for HUD is much higher. I mean, pre-2008, I, I can remember I was competing. I'm a mortgage lender here in Phoenix. I okay. was competing. Okay. I was telling people that they could qualify for an FHA loan. No problem. Better loan, better rate. They would then go to some other lender who would promise them an 80-20 loan, the, you know, no money down kind of deal. Um and they would give this false impression that you can't qualify for an FHA loan. There's no way. Your credit's too bad. You, you can only qualify for this type of loan. Um, and so a lot of those people got caught with the you know liar loans or 80-20s, 100%, got underwater really quick. Not saying they wouldn't have been underwater with the FHA loan. However, you think about back then how much, how much of a resource HUD was back then that wasn't utilized now. They've got fewer staff, but it's utilized. I mean, it's at least 60% of the, uh, well, 90% of the first time home buyers probably out there are using FHA for financing. Yet you've got fewer people in that, um, you know, but, 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 that, so. yeah, but, but, but again, it, it goes to the whole thing about government being involved in the mortgage business. I think they have a yeah, role to play that there's no doubt that the government has a role to play and, um, under the Fannie, Freddie, um, what, what do we what did we call them before a conservatorship? They were uh, quasi governmental agencies. Um, you know, yeah, Fannie, they're, they're still they divisions still kind of, up. Yeah, they're, they're still kind yeah. of. And and um, but now now they're under the conservative conservatorship. I think that's the right term. That's what is what they're yeah. under now. So like now the government right. has full control over them. Before the government oversaw those oversaw them and through committees. Uh, that, that Congress held. And that's how they regulated that industry. And up until the uh, 2000s, when some of the banking rules changed, I think right when Clinton was leaving, 98, he made some of the uh, some changes in, in finance and how banks could finance mortgages and how they could uh, pull all this these mortgage securities and sell them and everything else. Um, you know, there's a role government has in terms of keeping liquidity into the mortgage business. Um, you know, when all that was developed, when we got, uh, when the, the great depression happened and we got out of it. So we, we created the secondary market and that was the role Fannie and Freddie had was they, they found a way to get investors into the market that wanted to invest into mortgage backed securities. 
And it was a really simple system that worked for, I don't know how many years that was from the great depression all the way to, uh, we get to the two thousands when the rule or early late 1990s, early two thousands when the rules changed. And then that's when we got this whole, this change in how, uh, and how mortgage backed securities get financed, bought, sold, traded, and all the other craziness that happens and derivatives and all the craziness that happens with how they do that type of financing now in terms of not how a buyer buys it, but how an investor invests into it and gets that money into there. So the government had a role, has a role there to, to keep it regulated, but it's definitely, it's, it's definitely somewhere way past, you know, just regulating it. It it's part of it. It's involved in it now. So I, I don't yeah. know how, I, I don't know how, like how HUD HUD already is pushing, uh, you know, loans into, areas with less credit worthy buyers and stuff like that. That's not necessarily helping those areas. It's kind of considered a subprime, you know, in the conventional world, our world it is considered a subprime kind of deal. Um, It's interesting though, because HUD uh, beginning, beginning of the year, we, uh, we mentioned uh, in our last news um, news uh, blab here that HUD changed some of the loan limits uh, in certain counties. Right. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. changed some in, in Jacksonville, Florida, the average sales price of a home, I think is 170,000. Yet the, the, the FHA loan limit there is like 300,000. Yeah. yeah. Here in Maricopa County, it's 271. And there was some backlash here locally about, Hey, is HUD suppressing, you know, home purchase right. or home values or, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, th- they do have a role. Sometimes they get involved too much, but you know, I guess it's the world we live in. But yeah. let's move on to this because we're kind of beating that dead horse there a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it is without a doubt though. It's an interesting topic, and it's one of those topics that uh, not anymore here, <laughs> but it definitely deserves more, more conversation uh, in the future from everybody that's involved. The whole, the whole country. Here, here's the bottom line that I would say: until it becomes like right now, we talk about ISIS, we talk about. Um, you know, all kinds of other issues that our country faces yeah. until housing yeah. becomes an issue on the political stand, man, it's probably not going to change right now. I don't hear anybody in the debates or anything talking about housing and really there, there needs to be somewhat of a discussion there um, and some clarification on some things. Yeah. Uh, Cause nobody yeah. likes Dodd Frank either. Right. Dodd Frank financial reform. Nobody likes that, but no one knows, but what nobody's it is. Talking nobody, nobody understands what it is. I don't even understand what it is Yeah, it's behind <laughs> closed doors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, FHA is going to cut multifamily insurance rates. I don't know if you saw that or not. No, I and that's all in an effort to help affordable housing. <laughs> kind of, kind of, you like that? <laughs> a little. There you go. So, um, but they are going to cut the, the uh, mortgage insurance rate similar to what happened on the single family mm-hmm. insurance, insurance rates. Uh, they're going to drop uh, about, about a quarter percent from what I read. Um, yeah, they'll, they'll be at a 25 basis point, um, uh, annual premium annual rates will be at 25 basis points. Excuse mm-hmm. me. So the MI factor monthly will be 25 basis points on multi multifamily housing. So apartment complexes, anything over four units, that kind of thing. Right. That's a reduction right. of about 20 to 25 basis points over what it currently is right now. So that's an effort to help more section eight housing, more, right. you know, more stuff like that. So um, they, you know, like I said, they do have somewhat of a role. Is it enough? Nah, I don't think so. Like you said, it's a bigger problem. It's the economy and mm-hmm. we will, yeah. we will let that go from there. Now on the positive note, I got to bring myself out of negative town right now, or Hey, I'm in negative town with HUD. Um, KB homes. I saw their report. They came out with a report saying that yeah. they see a surge in demand in millennial boom and boomerang buyers. Now, boomerang buyers are the buyers that purchased. They had some difficulties, had the foreclosure, short sale, whatever, and they're, and they're coming running. back in the market. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that and, you know, and that's the thing that we it shouldn't actually be news that that should be something that our industry should be expecting to happen because um, it, it's about that time right now when they've had, there's been enough time for so many of those borrowers to get back up on their feet, you know, and and that was the whole purpose of doing short sales back in the day is that. Um, anyone who's doing short sales, uh, really your motivation would have been one, there was a way to stay active as a real estate agent, but two, that was, that really was the way to help borrowers out to, um, help them, you know, you know, not go through foreclosure 
and give them a better alternative to foreclosure through a short sale so that they could come back into the market at a sooner date, not a later date. And now's that time when it's happening. Well, it's good that the builders are starting to feel more confident. Um, yeah. That's a positive yeah. sign. Well, they um, want to. They they, they, they really want to. Research on this stuff. Yeah, they, the but, builders the builders are just waiting to get back. They want to be building yeah. again. They yeah. they got there's yeah. so there's land available. That they they want to they want to do it, but they also don't want to over leverage themselves. And um, now. You know, the, what's going to be they, interesting they, they learned a lesson already they, they learned a lesson hardcore so they're gonna you know they're they're yeah. op, they're op, they've been optimistic for years now <laughs> about the market yeah. so they're, they're they they want to to build more they're they're an, anticipating um yeah. the, i will say here I, I did say a report here recently at least here in phoenix that it's just difficult finding help um yeah. skilled labor to build some of these homes so they would even build more if they had the skilled labor workforce out there that we once had in phoenix so there's Same obviously that that's holding, it, holding it back too Same so but i thought it was positive no that, that that is positive and i think like i said i i think there's a it, again it ties back to the economy if you want yeah. the, the housing market to improve we have to get the fundamentals of the economy right you know not to go into all political and stuff but it's just right. economics 101 so foreclosures also um, fall to yeah. pre-recession lows, yeah. which is good news. That's that's positive. That's good. Um, that's absolutely good news. Not good news for the rehabbers and the real estate investors, yeah. but, uh, yeah, but definitely good, good news. Yeah. So foreclosure inventory is, is down low. All the shadow inventory. That you, if somebody tells me shadow inventory one more time, I'm going to tell them to go pound sand. Yep. I'm, I'm about it, tired it, of shadow it, inventory. It, it never existed. Yeah, I'm I'm like sick and tired of hearing that. Um, uh, not to go back into me- negative town, but I told you, you know, last year, um, this year would be the year of enforcement from the CFPB. Yeah, um, yeah. And that's holding true. Um, Goldman Sachs is to pay five billion, five billion, uh, in mortgage settlement, um, which is a lot of money. Was that this um, month? that that came? Does that announced this month or? Uh, January. It came out in January. Wow. That article. And and what what was that? What was that in regards to? Wells Fargo came out this month. They're paying 1.9 million or billion uh, in FHA uh, related, which I I have a little insight on the Wells Fargo deal. I, that this is all kind this Wells Fargo deal came from 2009. They actually were brokering or buying correspondent loans from, from lenders Mm-hmm. And they were um, the loans they were buying. Some lenders were charging minorities more in fees than they were non-minorities. And okay. Wells Fargo, okay. because they're servicing that, uh, when they got audited, um, they got hit with the penalty. And Wells Fargo said, "Hey, w- what gives? That's not us. That's the people. They're the ones who originate. We just bought the paper." And right. the CFPB said, "Well, sorry, you're servicing the paper. Therefore, you're stuck with it. So it's your problem." Wow. And so they immediately cut um, their their correspondent lending and just went to retail. So yeah, it it yeah, it's Jesus. And and uh, what makes that worse? Just a side tip in that story is that that doesn't really help. I mean, the whole thing is that we don't we shouldn't be singling out any group and all that kind of stuff. Everyone gets that, but then finding them that amount of money isn't really solving any kind of problem. Um, and in the long run, it just hurts the, uh, the industry, you know, you, you want mortgage banks and the banks to be doing the right thing. But if you go into a perpetual state of just punishing them for everything that happens, regardless of the, um, whether it's legit or not, it's, I don't, it's just, I, I don't know why I'd even want to be a bank and be in that business. Yeah, I, and I'll give you a little story on that one too. But Goldman's going to pay two point three billion in civil monetary penalties, eight hundred seventy five million in cash payments, and provide one point eight billion in consumer relief in the form Ouch. of mortgage forgiveness Ouch. and refinancing. That's how how it breaks down for them. So, and that's all that the shoddy mortgages that led up to yeah. the financial yeah. crash. That's that's what that penalty is stemming from. So this is two thousand sixteen. These are all loans that were made back in two thousand five, six, but, seven. But they didn't make the loans. They just bought those loans that were they, they, they were made by brokers or whatever somewhere else. But they just bought that paper. Yes. 
Yes. So it's um, this is the year of enforcement, and 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 according to this article, and I, I haven't seen anything that's more, uh, but it does say here um, that the this dwarfs some of its counterparts on Wall Street. Yeah. This penalty. Coming nearly eight years after the crisis, the settlement is by far the largest the investment bank has reached. I don't know why it says that. Related to its role in the meltdown, but the payments dwarf those made by some of its Wall Street counterparts. Yeah. So I haven't seen anything bigger. Five billion. I thought that was a big number. I thought that was a big number. That is a big number. No, nope. I've been keeping them bigger. Yeah. Um, there was, um, and I forget the bank, uh, it's for February's news articles, but I'll kind of touch base on it now. There was actually a situation you're talking about, um, you know, why you would want to be in the banking business or whatever. There's actually a situation where the bank just reached a settlement because they didn't want to go to go to court. And mm -hmm. It was all based on accusations um, and no fact whatsoever. Yeah. It was a consumer yeah. advocacy group yeah. that made some claims to a bank that mm -hmm. they were discriminating against some people. And they just said, you know what, rather than we can drag this through the courts and spend a lot of money on attorneys, we're just going to cut it loose right here. And it was, it was pretty hefty, man. It was, you know, I think it was like a billion dollars or something like that. It was a lot of money. It wasn't something cheap. So, but I'll have that for hopefully for next, uh, I, next months. I would like to find out where all those, where all that money for the fines actually is going to. I know. Right. Is that <laughs> my taxes? Have been cut, right. <laughs> you know, and it's not going it, to my local school. I don't, I mean, where is that money going? If they're going to take, I mean, if they're going to take the money away from the banks, which is what they want to do, then, um, you know, then let the, the thing that irritates me the most is that they're going to keep, you know, th this isn't, this is news, but also we've been hearing these huge fines for years now on, uh, you know, some of them legitimate and other ones, I, I would really question whether they're legitimate in terms of um, uh, picking on the banks and stuff. But well, how do you add that to man? I mean, what do you sit on a calculator? Okay, yeah. five billion. So, so where, where where is all that money? And then, uh, if they are going to go ahead and do it, fine. Okay, let them go do it. But then, uh, right. why aren't they then just putting all that money and doing all these? Uh, why don't they just rebuild communities with it? Why don't they just, uh, if, if they want to give all these loans out to all these people that say need loans but aren't getting them, why don't you just give that money to them and finance your, you know your own loans? I don't know. It's just. It, it it's just a, a to me it, it's just a big mess that doesn't help the mortgage business doesn't help the housing business yeah yep i agree chase um this kind of goes into last month's um it's kind kind of a continuation here of right. last month's newsmakers um in that mortgage uh, or bankers depository banks are losing more and more market share yeah uh, of the more world chase uh, posted fourth quarter mortgage earnings were down 21% um, last year or last quarter, excuse me, fourth quarter of 2015 bank of America income dropped 26% in the fourth quarter, um, of 2015 and due in large part to the lack of originations in their mortgage departments. Yeah. I think Wells Fargo <laughs> posted similar type earnings. I didn't pull Wells Fargo's, but just chase and bank of America. Um, but now that kind of, go ahead. I, 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 I think, I think that would, if I was those banks, I would almost think that that was kind of the plan was to, you know, st slowly and steadily kind of take a couple of little tiny baby steps out of the business. And if they lose money in those, in those, uh, in those divisions, maybe that's kind of wh where the direction they're headed towards. Yeah, no, you know, here's a little, here's a little insight, um, yeah. if you will. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't know this. In the banking world, when I used to work at, at Bank One, yeah. we would regularly, yeah. depending on the volume that we wanted to to generate, we would regularly increase or decrease the rate to uh, adjust the flow of loans coming in. Okay. So, for okay. example, if the going rate, for example, let's just say it's you know three point seven five. And we were down on revenue for that particular month or quarter. We would drop our rates and take a haircut on those deals and say, "Okay, we'll we'll offer three and a, three and a half. Open up a check, you know, Chase checking account or Bank One checking account, and we'll give you three and a half percent on your mortgage. Come come do your business with Chase." And vice versa, if we were overwhelmed, where our turn times were, you know, ninety days, as they similarly, you know, regularly are with these banks, we would increase our rates to four percent. So that would stop people from applying. 
And so this may be, uh, you know, I don't know what their rates are. I don't have their rates. I don't know what they're doing internally. So you might be right, right on in your thought process that this, this may not be anything. They may be just regulating what they do and don't want to do mm. uh, based on their, you know, um, performance, unless, if you will. Unless they like continually being, you know, <laughs> up the, you know, rear end with fines and fines right. over and over again. Like I said, it, for the, especially with Vel, Wells, Chase, and Bank, uh, and B of A, it, I mean, like I said, I, I don't love these people or anything like that. I'm just saying it's just... Um, you need somebody to lend money to you if you want there to be a housing industry. So um, somebody you're and you want a lot of players in that business doing that. So um, are you going to just continue to find them? You know, it's one thing if you find them, they do something wrong. But if they're doing things that, you know, it's kind of like on the borderline where like, you know, it's not really factual. Like the, the story you just you just talked about um, and they're constantly being, uh, you know, probed you know, like anally with, for every move they do and stuff. Uh, and they don't even understand the rules. That's what we talked about a couple of yeah. weeks back where the rules are just very confusing and not, and not like oh. direct. Yeah. They're, they're, the rules in place are just not, it doesn't tell them what they can or can't do exactly. And how do you, how do you run a business when you don't know exactly what the rules are and what you can say and can't do and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's yeah, why no, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It, it, Huh. It's a tricky, tricky, um, tricky deal. No question huh. about it, which, you know, kind of takes us to, to my next little thing here because yeah. the M an MLS report that came out, yeah. national mortgage licensing, um, report that came out, uh, that there's no growth in the state licensed companies. Yeah. Now this is the segment of, of mortgage originations or originations that, that I'm a part of, um, that anything basically that's not a non-depository bank, so brokers, mortgage bankers, um, that sort of thing, um, that falls into this MLS report. And to have no growth, I've been saying this for years, because of the restrictions of the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act and some of the things that are put upon us, uh, regulations that you're speaking of, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of people just don't even want to come into the business. Yeah. I mean, when I first came into the business... You're talking about uh, you mortgage, had a career like mortgage, mortgage brokers themselves, right? Like, you know, mortgage brokers, yeah, mortgage brokers yeah. bankers, whatever. Yeah. Uh, when I first came in, you know, I had a career path. I wanted to own my own, own my own shop and kind of like a yeah. realtor, right? right? You come do your real estate, work under a team, get your own brokerage, whatever, you know, kind of, you know, move up the ranks and do your thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, same thing in the broker world. But since the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Act, that killed it. It really killed the attitude. And right now there are very few young people coming into our business and yeah. if there's nobody to replace us it's a matter of time before that's gone and that means it goes to banks or other types of things now maybe which well, is going to take us to our next six thousand more people <laughs> and then we don't get the maybe. loans out that'll be, that'll be <laughs> okay, right he sounded um, like he was really sad but, when you said that hud cut eight thousand or six thousand people from their workforce um, i know right <laughs> no, I, 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 I agree with you. It, it, you know, if you were looking for a career, if I don't see anything about like, I don't, I don't see anyone saying like, yeah, I really want to be a mortgage broker right now. You know, yeah, who wants to do it, that? It, yeah. It just seems like a business. The banks have a bad vibe going around and when it comes to mortgages and mortgage, I don't know. It, it just, it, I, I, I could totally see that. I could totally see it. But if you're a mortgage broker, um, I think that there's just like the real, just like being a real estate agent, there's a lot of opportunities mainly because you know, there are, there's good mortgage brokers and there's bad ones. And just like real estate yeah. agents are good ones and bad ones out there. So, right. there's, so, there, so there's, that means there's plenty of opportunity for somebody who's good at their job to, um, uh, to take advantage of that. Yeah. I mean, who wants to come into an industry only to be told how much they can make and limit their potential? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and we that's, talked about that's that. Kind of, yeah, yeah, we talked about a couple weeks ago, and and I, and it it really does feel like mortgage brokers are going to go to some type of a you know non commission, but some type of salary based type pay. And if that ever happens, yeah. that's just a matter of time till that happens to the other side of the transaction for the real estate agents. Yeah, yeah, and there was an article here too, which that's kind of rolls into it, right? Is is whether or not consumer direct mortgage lending is dead? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's dead or not. I hope not. Um, but it might be. Um, it's a matter of time. Like I said, I mean, I hope that something gets figured out where we have, because on my side of the fence there, 
I always tell people we're in the service oriented business as realtors, as mortgage lenders, we're in a service oriented business. Our byproduct is real estate homes or loans or whatever it is. Right. That's a byproduct, but you're a service related industry. And so part of that service is having that face to face contact with somebody who's going to purchase one of the biggest investments of their life. It's a scary time for people. Um, and there's a lot of anxiety that goes along with it and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you take out that direct kind of personal touch to it, I think it loses a little bit of its uh, luster or whatever. I don't know what the right adjective is there, but it loses a little bit of its, um, you know, I, that's, that's the problem I see potentially with this rocket mortgage that, that Quicken Loans has. <laughs> uh, maybe it'll work. I don't know. Maybe millennials, maybe they don't care. I don't know. Did we talk um, about that last week? Was that like, was that, yeah. who was I just talking about? That was you, right? I, yeah, I, it was I, me. I, but I've been having a lot of conversations with mortgage brokers about the rocket mortgage in the last couple yeah. of weeks since these commercials start coming out. Yeah it, yeah. it was you and actually had a, I had a lot of hour long conversation with another mortgage broker here about the rocket mortgage. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, there are situations where it's, you know, a slam dunk. I mean, somebody can, they're putting 50% down. I mean, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel with some of this stuff, but it does lend the question, is that the same as a liar loan? And do we really want to go down that path to disrupt the integrity of what we've built over the past five or six years? Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't need to be this difficult. I mean, we already got, we just, I played that clip from Julian Castro yeah. and how difficult it is to still get a mortgage. Yeah. So th there is middle ground for sure. Yeah. You know, but, I think, but the way it's but not so extreme. Yeah. That you're going to get approved in eight seconds. I mean, come on. It's man. Eight doesn't. seconds, really? Yeah. Like I said, it, it, just, it just sounds pretty incredible. It sounds crazy, man, yeah. but crazy. Let's see, let's see how it plays out. Because I'm sure in the next couple of months, once, I mean, people are all seeing these commercials. And I'm I'm guessing that they're going to, that guarantee rate rocket mortgage commercial is going to be on during the Super Bowl this this weekend. Uh, because they, they've, would, been playing, would... they've been playing those commercials throughout all the playoffs. And I think they're they're warming up for that. So that means a lot of people have seen those commercials and a lot of people, must, I'm sure it's working for them in terms of bringing calls and emails and, and, um, and other types of uh, a lead gen activity into their uh, offices. So it's going to be interesting to see of all these, all the new business they've been able to generate from their advertising campaign, how much of that um, it became real business and how that all works out for them and, and the consumers. Well, here's an, here's another interesting article. Uh, these are all kind of, they're just lining up this way today, George. I don't know what's going on, man. The stars are lining up. But um, there's a software um, company called Blend Software um, that, and I'll just read this here. It says, Blend Software says it shouldn't take so long to approve a loan. Blend Blend's idea is to digitalize pay stubs, tax returns, bank statements, et cetera, so they can be analyzed by a computer in seconds. Mm. This typically... This is typical of software developers who don't understand that we don't lose that much time on these items. We lose it in regulation that mandate delays and in, in regulatory and uh, reviews that suck up time. We lose it when borrowers and others don't respond timely, not to mention the most pay stubs and other documents we get aren't of the quality that leads lends itself to digital digitalized data extraction. Yeah, I yeah. So it's such a small market. And that's kind of um, what I was saying about the the rocket mortgage. I mean, really, yeah, it's a big deal. But what is that like? Less than one half of one percent? I don't know of the actual people who actually qualify for that mortgage. And right. really, does it matter? Or is it just a you know maybe a yeah deal? maybe who knows how they're getting, maybe it is just a way that they're getting calls to come in the office so they can really just get them into another product instead of the rocket mortgage. You know, right. Uh, we are, I am starting to see more, uh, construction loans being offered out there. Uh, not so much on the lot side. I haven't seen that come back yet. Yeah. Um, yet. Uh, but I anticipate that probably will come back, uh, more really two with or three uh, stuff like rehab loans or. Well, or, or even like, uh, for custom homes, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, not just the 203k, not the rehab kind of stuff, but actual true construction from ground up kind of deal. Okay. okay. We're starting to see, uh, more of that. Um, hitting the market, which is a good sign. That tells a lot of people that there's some stability out there and they believe in the, that we may not have another bubble coming, so to speak. Um, so mortgage applications were up. Rates were down uh, January from December 
you know, the Fed raised the rates in December, but actually mortgage rates came down yeah. in January. Gas prices are down, obviously. I mean, I, I love my gas price right now. I think I paid a dollar fifty the other day. I paid a dollar forty yesterday. Ah, oh, you beat me. Oh man. Um, so with that being said, I, I always relate gas prices to um um as a precursor for home builders. Mm-hmm. At least here in Phoenix. Phoenix is kind of a spread out area. And so a lot of the home builders have their subdivisions on the outskirts of Phoenix. And as gas prices do, so do the sales in the outskirts of Phoenix. Mm-hmm. At least so I see. Yep. Um, so when gas prices were near five dollars, four and a half or whatever, people were selling their homes on the outskirts of Phoenix trying to move inland. Yeah. If you were in, some, yeah, they wanted to move inland. Area. Yeah. And they, they were selling their SUVs and everything. Right, right. And now gas prices are low, and we we're starting to see those those areas kind of rebounding there a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see how that continues or how it will continue. If it will continue, gas prices if they stay low, then I think we'll be in good shape. Well, um, the only reason why they're low right now is because the the China Chinese economy right now is down, and um, and you know until that gets kind of figured out, uh, OPEC's already lowered their production. Uh, Russia's Russia is playing a, a game right now. Uh, cause they're losing money, but they need to keep selling oil. So they're kind of, they, they, they want, they, they're bringing back their production to try to, uh, to try to tighten up the supply out there to try to raise prices. But with the Chinese economy being down right now, that's affecting, uh, the world economy. And it, it's pretty fascinating to watch all those players on that stage. Now, temporarily, we, we all benefit. We got the low gas prices and we're Americans and we love to drive and, and make, you know, we, we're all loving it right now, but. Um, the reason why there's low gas prices uh, really should be kind of a scary thing for everybody because um, with all those factors happening in other parts of the world, uh, that is going to affect us uh, at some point. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, uh, hopefully, uh, I like paying cheap gas. Uh, but cars, the other thing too, cars are getting more efficient. And if, if uh, incomes buy- increase. <laughs> I just bought an SUV. <laughs> Oh, you did. Yeah. And I get less gas mileage right now. It doesn't make sense, but I love it. Did you buy a Hummer? Man, did you buy an H2? No, I love my new uh, car. I got a Dodge Durango. Oh, there you go. I got, I've got a, um, I've got a little Kia Rio. Oh, yeah. I sing like Duran Duran every time I, her name was Rio. She did. Uh, but uh, that's my little joke there. But uh, and then I have I have a, a diesel Jeep Grand Cherokee, yeah, which yeah. gets really good gas mileage. Yeah, yeah I love that car. Yeah, it does. Um, now there is one last thing here. We're almost going to wrap this up because we're yeah, almost at our hour here. Uh, yeah, we're really close here. But I got one last thing here that um, that I wanted to kind of read here real quick. It says here, could we scrap credit scores? Oh yeah, so yeah I thought yeah, those. Yeah. Was- yeah. So a California-based online lender says they are doing just that. I'm going to read this here. S O F I. I'm not sure what S O. I don't know if that's Southern. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, a relatively new company claims it's better. It is better to just look at the credit along with the income, assets, and non-traditional credit. Sounds like what we did 20 years ago, right? Because uh, we didn't use credit scores, so they're kind of crapping the credit. Not crapping the credit score, but getting rid of the credit score uh, and just looking at the overall credit. Yeah, which is. What we kind of talked about a little bit, what what they're trying to do through the credit agencies a little bit. Well, yeah, because, you know, if you do all these little techniques, like we, you know, the guy we had on the show last week, you know, you can do all yeah. sorts of stuff to get your credit score pumped up. So like, um, which is awesome. I, I love all, I love that topic we talked about last week, but from a lending perspective, if you could spend six months just doing all these things to help your credit score, you know, improve. Um, yes, that probably means you're doing all the right things, you know, like, you know, paying, getting your debt down and, and then making these regular payments. But if all it takes to get your credit score up is making some regular payments, you know, um, it, 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 it would seem that for rating somebody's credit worthiness, it might not be all that effective. Like right now, um, I haven't, uh, I just bought a car uh, a few weeks ago and I have not had a car payment for like two years. And, um, uh, I, I don't have any debt anywhere else. So I don't charge and I don't charge a lot of things. So when I went to get financed, uh, my credit score was fine, but there was no, revo- there was like no 
um, uh, you know, I don't own anything that I'm making payments on right now. Um, so like, you know, cause I moved in with the girlfriend. So now, and you know, so then the mortgage is on her name. So like, uh, uh, but if, um, if I want to bring up my credit score and like, you know, all I gotta do is add a credit, add another credit card and just make a six payments, you know, charge 500 bucks a month and make six payments. And I can have this glorious credit score in like six months. And, um, I don't know, it, it's one of those things where there's like, uh, the credit scores are so confusing and stuff, but they also, I don't think they represent whether it, it really tells the test of if a, if a buyer's credit worthy or not. Yeah, I hate them. Yeah. They're, 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 it, it's not fair. As we said last week, I, I don't really like the credit scores. It is the game that we play. They try to, yeah. because the article does say here too, you know, if you have great underwriters, then it's okay to get rid of the credit scores because it's left up to the interpretation of the underwriter, how they're going to interpret that, that credit profile. Yeah. And that's true. Even with credit scores today, even with having credit scores, we have, um, inconsistencies within underwriting right, right? right. so um, you take the credit score out you don't even have that to fall back on you're gonna have all kinds of different interpretations and that's we I, I had that problem before where underwriters would say well that's I had one underwriter tell me specifically well that's not how I would have handled the situation I said well how can you put your personal touch into what this person's living on a day you can't do yeah. that yeah right. you gotta look at it subjectively you're judgment you're, you're being judgmental of their situation, you don't know what you would do in a situation. You haven't walked in their shoes. So that's what the credit scores were there to do is take some of that out, some of that judgmental type of attitude out of there. So I, I don't think credit scores are going anywhere, anywhere uh, soon. Yeah. And that's probably all portfolio stuff. They're not you know, sending that out and they'll run out of money before too long before, yeah. you know, before it, that idea takes off. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, but yeah, I, I could never see something like that go mainstream. All right, man. I think, uh, yeah, what do you think? We're, we, we yeah, we're, push, we're pushing up here. You know, the one one thing I wanted to add there, and I was wanted to ask you, did you see the movie The Big Short yet? No, uh, but I saw some funny dude here on Blab. Yeah. What's his that, name? He was I'm gonna, talking about that guy. He said it was really good. I'm going to try to watch it this weekend. I'm, you know, that's a fascinating subject. And uh, I, I've heard that it's good. I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, if it's uh, based on any kind of reality at all. But um, I am curious to see how they portray it. Yeah, it's supposed to be about the crash, two thousand eight. Yeah, right? it's all about it's all about the crash. It's all about the crash, and uh, you know what the big banks on New York and New York were doing. So, like, I'm interested in the subject, and I'm, and I know it's tied to us and stuff like that. But I don't know if it's based on actual reality or not. All right, cool. So with that, let's let's go ahead and end the show. Next week, we're going to have an appraiser on, so please subscribe. It's already scheduled in the blab and if you're not watching us here on blab you're watching the replay you missed out uh we'd love to have you join if you want to join if you're bashful that's fine there's a chat room that you can chat with us on um and if there's anything you'd like to add by all means so next week we're going to have how to get a fair appraisal i think is going to be the topic or anything about appraisal so if you have appraisal questions or have had appraisal issues i've got an appraiser we have an appraiser that's going to be attending this blab and um, we can certainly fire some questions at him. So please attend that. Subscribe. Visit my website, www.Valley of the Sun Real Estate Show. Subscribe to my podcast, Valley of the Sun Real Estate Show in iTunes. Please write a review on there if you like it. I hope that you do because I put a lot of effort into that. Dad. All right, cool. So Jorge, how do, tell everybody, do your plug, buddy. You can find me at agentredefined.com. And I am the women's council realtor's favorite Mexican this week. So you can probably find me somewhere <laughs> there if you hashtag WCR. Um, well, I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you next week. I'm actually looking forward to this appraiser show because uh, just like with the credit repair guy last week, there's just so many, so many things going on in the world of appraisal that I would love to It'll be uh, talk about. He's a good guy and we can be very honest with him. He's not bad. He'll, he'll tell it like it is. So yeah. he's very thorough. Awesome. He's just like an awesome. appraiser. So it'll be good. Um, yeah. All right, cool. All right, man. I got to run. Jeannie's here and she wants to cook dinner. All right. See you, buddy. See you, ma'am. Jason Bates, MLS 220798, mortgage banking license 1796, equal credit opportunity lender. Sound effects provided by soundj.com. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>